Okay, uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Rafael Repullo. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Econometric Society, and it is a great honor for me to chair the presidential address of uh, the Econometric Society, which is going to be delivered by Professor Ben Holmstrom. Uh, this session only lasts for an hour, and we all want to hear Ben rather than me, so I will be brief. Ben studied mathematics and physics at the University of Helsinki, and did his PhD at the Graduate School of Business, Stanford University. In 1979, he started as an assistant professor at Northwestern University. In 1983, he moved to Yale, and since 1994, he is the Paul Samuelson Professor of Economics at MIT. Ben Holmstrom is a theorist that has written seminal papers in many areas of economics. I just want to mention a few. First, it is his early work on contract theory that has been so extremely influential. Uh, in particular, the two papers published in the Bell Journal of Economics, uh, Moral Hazard and Observability and Moral Hazard in Teams, uh, which by the way have the first one more than 5,000 Google Scholar citations and the second one almost 3,000. Second, his work on managerial incentive schemes including his famous papers with Paul Milgram, multitask principal agent analysis and aggregation and linearity in the provision of intertemporal incentives, a really beautiful paper published in Econometrica in 1987. Third, I would like to mention his work with Jean Tirol on financial intermediation, loanable funds and the real sector, which has inspired many papers, including some of my own. In this line of research, there is also the 1998 JPE paper with Tirol on private and public supply of liquidity, as well as his recent book with also with Jean Tirol on inside and outside liquidity. His address today deals with a very topical issue, namely understanding financial crisis, such as the one that started uh, in 2007. He argues in the paper that financial crises are about debt. So we could say that there is a dark side of debt, but if there is a dark side, there must be a bright side, for otherwise agents wouldn't use debt. So this bright side, as you will see, is related to the role of debt in liquidity provision. But this should be enough by way of an introduction. I should stop now and let Ben Holmstrom deliver his presidential address, which has a very suggestive title, The Nature of Liquidity Provision When Ignorance is Bliss. Ben. Thank you, Rafael, and uh, as you know, Rafael is the executive vice president of the society and, uh, and soon to retire, uh, unfortunately, because he has been absolutely wonderful. And uh, he is the person who knows something about the society as opposed to me. It's a great honor to be president of the society and, uh, and certainly a great pleasure to be here in, in Santiago today. Uh, it's uh, my first trip to South America, so uh, and uh, couldn't be a better day, couldn't be a better place. So thank you very much for inviting me. I want to talk about uh, a topical topic, uh, which is, uh, is uh, essentially about the financial crisis. And uh, maybe I should start by just saying that I think uh, as economists we have been humbled by the events in the sense that uh, I think very few of us can speak with, uh, with a great deal of confidence or, or uh, or uh, even uh, pride, though I do not share the view that uh, we are somehow responsible for this crisis, but it, it is humbling to see something happen that most of us thought would never happen. Uh, and uh, that's what I want to focus my address on. Mainly draws on the work uh, together with uh, Trivi Dang and uh, Gary Gorton, who, uh, uh, with who I have cooperated on the topic, and I will say some words about the paper that underlies this address. On the whole, this will be a pretty informal address. I don't think the, this auditorium is not as easy, perhaps, to, to see behind the trees, you know, uh, formulas and such. I don't think uh, equations ever are very easy in big settings like this. But I have a point. Let me just make clear that if I don't get across this point, then I have really done badly. I have a point uh, uh, that relates to, the, that's why I also started with the humbleness because I want to be a bit provocative and it's a point of view that, uh, that uh, I wouldn't say is controversial necessarily but seems always to uh, generate some discussion. And uh, that's suggested by the second half of the title, When Ignorance is Bliss. So let me start with the common view of course is this, I'm not saying you share these views, but this is a very typical uh, view of say 
not just the public, I want to emphasize, but actually a lot of economists. And basically it runs, you know, it's looking at the causes of the crisis. It puts a lot of blame on Wall Street, incentives, greed, you name it. It puts a lot of blame on the asset-backed securities to originate and distribute system, what we call the shadow banking system, which I will speak briefly about also. Uh, a lot of blame on the rating agents. And uh, all of this is captured in a book that uh, I don't know how many of you have read, probably not that many, but uh, a well-known book in the US called Michael Lewis, uh, written by Michael Lewis called The Big Short. It's actually a very worthwhile read. That is, uh, it's, uh, it's a well-written book. I think it's a serious book. Uh, its conclusions are essentially that something went really wrong basically on Wall Street. And, and the thing that went wrong was that Wall Street didn't seem to know anything about what was going on. In particular, they didn't know anything about the value of the assets and they were traded in deep ignorance. So the book could have been called The Big Ignorance instead of The Big Short. And his, he sort of doesn't explain it uh, really, but he concludes that that's really troublesome. And uh, the implication that has been drawn, he is not the first one that concluded there has been ignorance, you know, so, uh, and the blame is on this opaqueness of the system and the difficulty to, that, to see through the system. So as a consequence, you will see that most people will say one of the first things we need to do, and moves have been made already in that direction, we need to get to more transparency. We cannot live in the kind of world that we lived in where nobody knew anything, not even Wall Street. So that's the, that's the straw, I wouldn't say it's a straw man, but that I think is a reasonable description of what the state of mind is of a lot of people. And I will come back at the end and talk about the European crisis, and I will make the provocative position that, that, that had they understood liquidity the way I'm trying to explain it, I don't think they would have done what they did in July. I think they did it because they thought transparency is good. And I'm going to argue something different. I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not going to say transparency is, uh, is bad, but I'm going to say it matters a great deal what one means by transparency and who handles the matter. So here's the alternative view. Why didn't anyone ask questions on Wall Street elsewhere? Why, why did they live in this ignorance? And to be blunt, this is the main message. Because ignorance is really this in the sense of not asking questions. That is liquidity. So any talk about liquidity and thinking that somehow or another this is a state of mind where everybody is asking questions all the time, that just couldn't be more wrong. Liquidity is fundamentally about not having to ask questions. So you know, the reading of the big short and why didn't anybody ask questions, that's, a, that's not a good question. The answer to that is because they were dealing with liquidity provision. They were in money markets. The question then comes, was the money market too big and should something be done about it? And I will come back to that and talk about that. Transparency is a very good way of reducing liquidity. I repeat, transparency in my view, uh, as I will explain, these are subject to qualifications, is generally speaking a way of reducing liquidity. So if you want less liquidity, which is a very plausible position today, uh, then, uh, then actually transparency might be the way to go. I don't want to, given the time, I'm not going to talk about, my need to have some philosophy usually about what, what caused the crisis. And I, I think uh, I just want to mention, I, I subscribe to the view that this has to do with, uh, with the imbal global imbalances. And, and the, f the interesting question is why did US get trapped into this? And I think the answer is exactly because they had the resources to provide or absorb the imbalances better than anybody else, and that's thanks to the uh, shadow banking system. So it was a form of private money, but I won't go into that. So I will do the ignorance bliss story. That's the first part is the essence of the story. It's not going to come with any equations or anything. 
Uh, I will see where I am with time, and then I will do the, uh, a little sketch of the model. So there is a model behind this thinking. It has developed from the model. And then I will talk of, uh, say a few words about the panic and then uh, some of the policy conclusions that come. So uh, the point is that I think it really is important uh, to dig deeper into understanding what happened, and that means dig deeper into understanding what liquidity exactly is about. So uh, let me start uh, with, uh, uh, liquidity is a much used word, so it's a bad word, but one can't avoid it in this context. I can't invent another word that somehow would be better because then you wouldn't even listen to me. Uh, the key point is liquidity in money markets is a very different thing than liquidity in the stock market. Liquidity in the money markets has to do, money markets are what I call high velocity markets, and I'll just give an example. It is a market where you have to turn over, you know, uh, uh, approve a continuation of a loan, for instance, in the tri-party repo market, that's over trillion dollars a day. In fact, all the repo contracts in the tri-party market have to be rolled over every day. They are unbound and bound back again. So uh, it, is a, it is a massive amount of transacting. And that all has to essentially be done within an hour. So that already tells you, you don't make those, and, and by the way, the unit of the money that's, the trade is of the order of millions, 100 millions, even billion dollar single trades. So we are not talking about, you know, small amounts of stock or something like that. The Fed is a big player, other big players, banks, intermediaries. You, these are trust-based markets. You got to believe, you cannot start investigating these markets and ask yourself, should I roll over? When you are in the place where should I roll over is in your mind all the time, then we are already very in, in a very dangerous situation just like we see right now in the, in the European markets. So shared understanding, trust is the essence of it. The, the question is of course, how do you get there? Stock markets, just uh, to contrast this, uh, is you know, you don't have to make trades unless it's Witching Friday or something like that. You don't have to make trades. You, if you don't like what you see, you, don't, you just don't buy, you don't sell, you just let it go on. It thrives on, ho on just the opposite of what is true in money markets. That is, it's not about shared beliefs, is my belief. It is very much about, you know, heterogeneous beliefs. And you see this difference pretty starkly in the fact that even minute pieces of information matter for the stock market. Massive amounts of money is spent on analyzing the stock market every day, whether it's worth all the dollars, but privately it appears to be worth all the dollars. Analysts analyzing money markets, bond markets and such, are a small fraction of the attention paid to the, to the uh, to the stock market. So these are totally different markets and that is part of the clue. Both are liquid in a certain sense, but the one is liquid because nobody really asks any question and trust it. The other one is liquid because a lot of people believe that they can actually make you know, money on, on, on being in that trade or that they have to be in, in the flow. And I think it has to do with this, um, this nature of information. So the question is, uh, so this is the, assertion that money markets are really all about in this sense ignorant or people can ignore information. And so the question is how, how is it that we have thought differently about it? And here is a suggestion I'm trying to read into the minds of people why this comes as a surprise because when you hear it, it sounds pretty obvious. One is that we start from the view, I think all of us share the view that symmetric information about payoffs is liquidity. In, in, in this market. And the second thing is, from this, they conclude that symmetric information, in order to get there, we have to have transparency. Everybody has to see the same thing. This is not logically true. As a matter of fact, I'm making the assertion that symmetric information, in a lot of instances, can best be achieved by shared ignorance, that's my language. It has to come with some form of certification to give the trust, 
but actually going in the, the state where none of us knows anything is also a symmetric information state. The case where the state where all of us know everything is a much harder state, uh, state to achieve. And the reason it's much harder state to achieve is that in, most, in a lot of instances when you bring out information, it actually makes beliefs more heterogeneous. I'm not going to give, it's easy to write in a dollar, it's, it's familiar from uh, old literature, the, the Lucas literature on, on, uh, on um, macro used that, you know, Lucas didn't use it, but, uh, but Larry Weiss and other people after him. So it's, it's very simple, but if, we Im if in colloquial terms we want to de describe it, you know, if I put something on the table, say, you are a mechanic, I'm a, a, a regular person, and we see a car there and we just get to look at this car, and then more information comes on the table in the sense that uh, they put a manual or a, a report on, on uh, uh, you know, a mechanical report on the car or something like that, I, may I typically will become much in placed in a much more adverse situation because the mechanics happens to be able to read what he sees. So it's, a, it's that the mechanics, no, this knowledge is relevant for the mechanics, it's not relevant for me, and that creates the asymmetric information. And for instance, auto auctions that want to have high velocity are for that very reason uh, actually created so that people cannot try out the car, they cannot lift the hood, they cannot drive it, uh, all these are meant to actually, in my view, uh, make information less symmetric, uh, more symmetric. So here is the best, here's sort of the most uh, interesting example. It's not most economically the most important because it's interesting because it seems similar to the shadow banking system's way of, uh, uh, of securitizing mortgages and other, other uh, debt instruments. So De Beers and Diamonds, this is coming from Milgram Roberts, but I just come from Amsterdam, so I heard that it's a story that is uh, pretty true. Uh, when De Beers says wholesale diamonds, meaning those small diamonds that most of us can afford at least one of, uh, not the very valuable and special ones, they put the diamonds into a bag, they put a stamp on the bag, they weight it, they tell how much it weighs, they say the equivalent of triple A, so it's like the bag has a triple A label, another bag has a double A label, and the key point I want to make, they do it to hide, to they close up the bag and buyers cannot open up the bag. You either buy the bag or you don't buy the bag, but you don't get to see what's inside the bag. Now, of course, you, uh, the BS is there, the BS is not going to fool you, it works. If they were doing this only once, we wouldn't have any buying. But their reputation as collateral, uh, this is actually a very efficient system. You see it in recycling, which is a business I am in, the same idea. You see it in course bond ratings. It is one of the problems actually was that the, 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 the categories got to be very big and, uh, and the, the stuff inside the categories such as uh, structured product tranches versus you know, corporate bonds or something like that all went under the label of AAA, but uh, course bond ratings has been a staple. It's hard to explain why they could, they could certainly do a better job. It's not that they don't have the money or energy or something like that. They are probably purposefully doing it course. In fact, most of the relevant rating is in the AAA category. They used simple formula or no, naive formula, which people now look at and laugh at. It's called the Lee formula. A lot of them used it. It's not important that it was not so good or not as good as, you know, the masking formula or the Tyrol formula, since Tyrol is in the audience. You know, Tyrol formula would be a bad thing for this case, even if it was twice as good, because we don't want different formulas to be used, at least publicly. So you see, it's all about standards, about language, about commonality of understanding, uh, securitization I won't talk about, but uh, it is part of the process of obscuring in, a so in the sense of putting things in a bag. Uh, Tyrol will speak more about it on Friday. It's a, it's a, tomorrow it's a more complicated issue than I'm implying. Uh, money market funds is a very interesting case because it's being discussed a lot. But money market funds are funds that every day they know what the value is of their funds. And sometimes it's not 100, which it should be, or a dollar, as it's called, a buck. 
it goes underneath, uh, below it, you know, to 98, 99, and so on. It's very frequent. It goes sometimes above it, or it often goes above it. But the point is that they, historically, before this crisis, they had to only publish the net, NAV stands for net asset value. The value of their position, they had to publish only every half a year, biannually. And even then, they wouldn't have to publish that it on that date. It would be 60 days before, you know, earlier. It's like, um, you know, the, the it's really in some sense, it's related, you know, to the way the Federal Reserve uh, releases information about what they discussed at their meetings. Now they have to, now money market funds are obligated to give their net asset value once a month. It's in the Dodd-Frank regulation. However, they still have to do it only with 60-day lag. So this is an absolute deliberate attempt to disguise something that is totally knowledgeable every day. And the industry, now the big debate is that SEC is going to say, is now insisting and hoping to get through the idea that these money market funds will have to tell every day what the value of the asset is. And it's an interesting debate. And my assertion, and this is like uh, standing and making a prediction, they do that, these money market funds will be entirely different vehicles. They will not be vehicles of liquidity anymore in the way I used to, uh, they used to be r before the crisis. It may be, by the way, the right thing to do. I'm not arguing that, I'm just saying we better understand that it's not going to enhance liquidity. It's going to be a different animal. And of course, the ultimate obscure instrument with the ultimate certification still behind it is money. You pick out your bill, whatever it is, you know, the Chilean peso. You, I, nobody has a clue what the value is behind it. Zero. That's why, you know, we are absolutely equally ignorant, all of us, and there's no news any day that's li likely to come on the table that somehow would shake that shared ignorance. And it is, therefore, the most va liquid instrument in the world. Maybe not the any of the money. Euro has some problems, it seems, right now. Uh, I'm coming back to that, by the way. It doesn't mean it's going to stay that way all the time, and that's part of the... So the implication for liquidity provision is that uh, you want to be insensitive to information. Public information that comes, private information in the sense that you don't want people to spend time figuring out something so that, you know, is the car better or is this debt contract better? That's bad news. So, for instance, when we look at asset-backed securities, in a sense, they were much more transparent than banking's. banks ever are transparent. Banks are, of course, also a giant, you know, asset-backed security, so to speak. Anything they issue is asset-backed by something much more opaque than the asset-backed securities. But nobody really cares to read. This is, it's still, you know, hundreds of pages. The manual that says what's inside the, the bag of asset-backed securities people are not going to read it. And that's the way it's supposed to be. That's my assertion, that's the idea. So from this desire to have a shared information or see the world the same way, and that this happens not where everybody sees everything conceivable, but actually where everybody sees barely anything or the sort of the minimum necessary, if you wish. From that perspective comes the one of the really powerful empirical pieces of evidence to the story, which is anything that has to do with money markets is has to do with debt. So why is debt, you know, the absolute favored instrument when it comes to money liquidity provision? The answer is low volatility, low sensitivity to the public information, low incentives to, uh, to actually explore information. You know, it's, uh, I won't talk, uh, uh, Sean will talk tomorrow m much about the equity not traded, but it is notable that treasuries don't have an equity component. A lot of the debt that goes into these money markets actually don't have an equity component. Corporate debt is a separate issue. So here is a little schematic thing about, uh, I'm, I'm trying to make, this is, this I tries to explain why it is that uh, why it is that the public is so hot on transparency. So why are they now standing up all and crying? 
But how could they know anything about anything? Oh, oh, about the securities. You know, why were they so ignorant? Why didn't people ask questions? By the way, economist at Jackson Hole, the one time I've been there in 2008, and I won't mention any names, uh, I mean, the best of economists stood there and asked exactly Michael Lewis's question. How was it possible that Wall Street traded with such ignorance? This was a subject of conversation, and, and so had you regulated something that day at Jackson Hole, it would have been all about transparency, increasing transparency as the medicine. And what I'm putting down here in this uh, very simple graph where the red line is the exercise price of, of, of death and the black line is the price of death when you look at it at some distance, you know, one month ahead or it still has one year ago to go and so on, this becomes an option value. And, uh, and so it's, the, it's, the, it's the, the, the inverse of the, or reverse of the put option that the debt holder has. Uh, I want to look at the implications it has for this information sensitivity and this no questions asked. So when we are in the, I, I, don't, I guess I do have a, a, a thing, but uh, not everybody can see it. If you go to the right on the asset value scale, that is the collateral that supports the debt, you go to the right in that scale, have higher asset value, you come to a region where the black line, which is the value, market value, so to speak, of debt, and the red line, which is the exercise price of debt, the face value of debt, say 100 those are essentially the same. And you can see that if I move around the asset value by a few hundred dollars, it doesn't make any difference. If your house is worth a million or a million and 100,000 or a million and 500,000, makes no difference if we owe me if the face value of the debt is 100,000, that it backs up. You are just not interested, even if you, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bother even to hear if you try to explain what the value of your house is. That's not, for me, it's enough that I know that it's enough. That's the key, common shared knowledge. The world gets very different. In the rare event when you get pushed to the left in this diagram, asset values start dropping. Actually, you end up going from what I call in the blue here, information insensitive region, meaning I'm not interested in, in nobody asks any questions. You go into a region where suddenly it dips very close to being essentially equity. When it goes into default or near default, you can see from the black line or from the red line even more starkly how it gets much more information sensitive. And suddenly it matters to me a great deal whether your house is worth $99,000 or $110,000. In fact, every dollar starts to matter when we go below 100,000. So there's an enormous shift or discontinuity really going from the state where I'm saying, I don't really care what your house is worth, to saying, I really want to know what's inside, what the house is worth, or in the case of asset-backed securities, what the value of the assets are inside. So everybody suddenly wanted to open these bags. That was the first instinct. You know, let's just get up there and, you know, clean out the banks and have the, ba you know, the bags open, and then we know what's in there. I'm going to assert that I think in mo the empirical evidence as to how one successfully has gotten out of this crisis indicates that that's, the r that's the just about the wrong, uh, I wouldn't say it's the wrong road, it's sort of yes, we have to deal with this value, uh, the lower valuation, but the opposite direction is actually the solution in most instances. You go back to that wonderful state of ignorance is bliss, where you don't have to ask questions. And the only route there really is to collateralize back. So that's going to be a, one of the important empirical implications, or, or the policy implications. Something is not working here, but let me hopefully. So, uh, so that you don't get the idea that uh, that this is all about you know just maximizing ignorance. The point here is that relying on debt, securitization, course rating, mechanical rules, all these things make a lot of sense. This is not insanity, quite the contrary. This is just the way liquidity providing markets are supposed to work. And people's pondering of why didn't they ask questions is exactly because they worked. This is exactly the way it should be. However, 
it does put ri push risk into the tail. You can do, you can expand on the liquidity, for instance, by shortening maturities and such things. The region that is information insensitive will grow. But the problem is that, you know, it just pushes the risk into the tail. And very importantly, I think, it hides the systemic risk. If we have a system where nobody is meant to ask very many questions, where are you going to go get the systemic risk? Again, couldn't be more different, different than, say, the case of, of, of stock markets, where systemic risk is supposedly the only thing that prices security. So there is an uncomfortable, very uncomfortable social trade-off. We have this coarseness and ignorance that provides liquidity, but at the same time it increases both the risk, it pushes it in the tail, and the cost of the crisis certainly is increased by the fact that we have put things into the bag. That if we ever end up in that tail distribution, we have really that tail risk ri gets materialized then we have a very high price to pay. But so you say, well, so what was new about that? My point is going to be, the, what's new about it, it, I'm thinking about liquidity differently. And I'm recognizing that if anybody who looks at this social trade-off and thinks, you know, transparency is just automatically the good thing, I think they will go just completely wrong. In the sense that they will actually cause, in my p forecast, liquidity to dramatically drop. This is in the state, I'm emphasizing, the crisis state is a different state, and I believe again that, uh, that Jean Tirol will speak about more about the crisis state. I'm talking about how it was meant to plan. So notice that this is an answer. Why didn't anybody ask questions yesterday, and why is everybody crying for transparency today? That question is, in my view, completely answered by the, what I just said. So uh, I will have to somewhat reluctantly skip uh, the, what happened to my phone? Uh, I have to look at the time. So let me just give uh, the briefest of sketches. Uh, there is a model that substantiates in a particular way this view. And it's a model which is set up so that we have three parties, A, B, and C. We have three dates. Here it says just t equals one and t equals two, but the third date is just when payoffs are realized. So there are two trading dates. And uh, the trading game goes as follows. The, the problem we are trying to solve is that B wants liquidity in the sense that B has an endowment at date one, and you see it down there as UB on the line of UB, you see that U has a, a utility function that CB1 plus alpha CB2 plus CB3 and his endowment is at date one. Endowments are not contractible in this model. So he has a problem that because alpha is greater than one, he would somehow like to get that W into date two, when he values it at alpha greater than one rather than consuming it at date one. That's the, that's the problem that we are, this is a very, very, this is the most elementary model where the problem of the need to have some liquidity comes up, in this specific sense at least. And so there is one vehicle he can use, and that vehicle is the fact that A has an asset that is contractible. Something, this is the random variable X. X is realized in period three. And we can write contracts on X. So we can write a contract, with A and B can write a contract that says, uh, I sell you S of X for a certain price, P1. And that's how B1 can get, instead of consuming W at date one, B can actually transport S of X or the, or, or the security S of X into date two. But if he just, it's equally critical for B that he needs to be able to sell it at day two, because if he just carries it into day three, these people are risk neutral, then he again is in the same situation, that he just consumes it and he never got to consume at day two the way he wanted. So C is very critical here. C is the person to, on to which he can unload the security. And he can do so, 
at writing not just by selling S of X, and this is important for our analysis and our thinking. Uh, this is one of the things we learned when we did it, you know, a model, so this it's worthwhile doing a model because he's not that just taking S of X and selling S of X forward. He is typically doing S, he can, wh what he can do is take S of X, then use S of X as collateral to write another contract on S of X, which is called here S hat. And the Y here is equal to S of X. So that's how the trading goes. The, uh, the ideal situation with the endowments we have here is for W to be consumed by B at date two. And that could be achieved. So the idea would be that A would sell something for b value W to B, B would consume that W at date at, at date uh, two, and then pass it on to, you know, by passing on the security to C, and then C would consume, uh, consume the uh, W at day three. But notice, A and C are indifferent about when they consume. The only purpose of the trading here is really to actually consume, uh, have B consume uh, at, uh, at day two. This is as simple as this model gets. You know, if alpha is set equal to one, there would be nothing to study. When alpha is bigger than one, this problem is non-trivial. And so uh, let me just say, uh, given the time, that this trading game works so that we have elements to make this more complicated. And the elements are the, the risks of trading, perhaps I should say, for B is the value of S of X may change just because the world changes, the housing market changes. If you think of X as housing, you know the value of the house changes. So that's risk number one. Risk number two is that if the value of the of the market uh, changes sufficiently, just like in that one graph with the hockey stick, the reverse hockey stick, it may be that C actually gets interest in acquiring information. And if he acquires information, the idea is then we are going to trade under adverse selection and that's going to be a much worse scenario for B. So there are two risks. The value of SX goes down just exogenously. The second risk is that it will go down so much that that triggers information acquisition by C. <coughs> and so we are asking, and this is the problem that, the, that we are focusing on, what is the best S of X to design, given that we understand this whole play out? And the main result and, and the objective in choosing S of X is just to maximize the expected value that B consumes. And the answer to that question in our paper is that it's optimal for A to issue debt and, and because it overcomes both the information acquisition problem as well as the volatility problem or the value fluctuation problem. And I think I'm afraid I have to leave it at that because I want to get to, to so this is all about the model. Uh, and let me also skip the shadow bank. Let me say a word about the panic. This is an arresting picture. What is here is sort of not so material, but it, it is actually the value, it's sort of a picture of the pricing or the commonality of pricing of a trip double A home equity loan. There is a different picture for triple A. This comes from a paper by Perodin and, uh, Perodin and Wu. I don't know how the names are pronounced, never met the people, but a very interesting paper. Uh, you see that it runs from August 2006 to January 2008. So it doesn't capture the Lehman shock. God knows what happened after that. but. The key point I want to make here that there was a shock before Lehman that started it all, and that was a shock that one of the Bear Stearns subprime funds had to be dissolved. And that happened in July of 07, or just by July, August. And so when you look at that graph where it, the, the black line or the very tight line that runs from January, August 2006 to July 2007, it is an indication nobody asked any questions because these are actually bilateral trades and everybody priced it the same way, probably just at 100. When, the, when suddenly the subprime uh, fund was, uh, had a problem, that was a big wake up call to everybody. It was exactly no questions asked and suddenly you know, everybody being shocked into saying, 
oh my, this can happen. You know, the euro can go under, you know, anything. And the, and the answer is that this, you see how these bilateral, these, these are realized prices, how they spread out, reflecting actually now people asking questions, evaluating them personally, and having no commonality of information at all with regard to what the value is. And, uh, and so this fits the story I told you. And as I said, you can draw, uh, they have a whole sequence. The paper, there's a very interesting paper by Kaplan and Leib that makes the point, you know, that I wasn't aware of initially, but basically the point that when you have a system where no questions are being asked, that's how it's designed and meant to work. It has one big drawback. Information accumulates and gets trapped inside it. You know, a million states get seen as a single state essentially by people, which is no default yet. And then suddenly you go from no default to default or something like that. That is a real discontinuous event. And that's one of the pieces that explains why you have a crisis. Against this, I wanted just to say a word about asset impairment. The crisis came in two pieces. And this picture, which uh, indicates spreads of these uh, securities, a different picture, also really starts on July 2007. But then it shows that you know, the markets got increasingly nervous about the low quality tranches of these, uh, these loans in the AB. These are traded ABX index markets. But you see AA and, and the AAA, nothing happened to them until July 2007. I'm sorry, I should have said this was, oh, they were already nervous. I said something wrong. The, the market was already nervous to some extent about the, uh, about the lowest quality trade. But the double A and triple A were flat the way I was, that the previous picture indicated. And then happened this uh, Bear Stearns uh, fund default and, and, uh, and it detached itself. So the point I'm making here, there was information. And by the way, there was uh, information on housing. Housing had dropped, you know, a lot already by July 2007. But somehow people did not, they ignored it in the sense of not reacting to it. So this is an important lesson. There's that version of transparency as well, which is makes matters complicated, is that you can put it out there, but people aren't just going to, you know, they are not going to pay that much attention to it. That's another possibility. Here is the scariest picture from my point of view as an economist. So you see the red line is how the assets get impaired in the sense of increasing spreads. Nothing happens to the, nothing much happens except for the July event. Nothing much happens to the measure, the standard measure of how risky people perceive the banking system to be. That's the liar spread. And you see the blue line just bobbling along. It's not flat, maybe some nervousness, but it sort of moves along, doesn't it? Until Lehman happens and then bang, you have an enormous increase in the, in the spread. So the point I'm trying to make is, Asset impairments can come as local, you know, the interpretation here is that there's a information contagion stage one where some group of assets get affected and spreads start to increase, but it is relatively localized. Then you have deleveraging and perhaps uh, systemic risk coming from that part in the form of fire sales. But the really big event for this crisis, for this crisis at least, was obviously Lehman, which was a contagion. And I am subscribing to the view of Caballero and, and Simsek, which says the problem with Lehman was really nobody knew or people feared that this, this would, you know, just the whole system will go. Exactly the same situation as in Europe right now. So uh, we have what I'm, the last line is important. I think we have a very ba poor understanding of the path panic still, but a these are stages of the panic. But the word panic comes from the fact that it's a really a discontinuous state of mind, and I think very importantly, an information event, as opposed to just a fire sale event or something like that. And uh, for the people who are interested in modeling, I think that's an important line. So let me just say, uh, by way of concluding, well, first of all, that so my main points have been that Money markets are purposefully information poor. 
That's, that's a very different view from liquidity provision than what you hear. It is deliberately designed not to be inducing people to follow information in any careful way. So absolutely not about transparency in that sense. And banking has never been transparent. Never. There is a saying that is very indicative. If a banker has to explain his credit worthiness, he's already lost it. That's a, that's a standard saying. That's exactly capturing the idea. If I have to start opening the bag and saying, look, my diamonds are really good, you say, forget it. You know, that's, that was it. And so uh, that we have to think about. And, and uh, I know that Sean has a, I keep saying that Sean has a model and uh, uh, elaboration to some extent of these things, but also uh, views that are contrary to this. Uh, so you should listen to that. But I at least, this much I feel very confident about. Liquidity is about not, in the money market, it's about not asking questions. You, you, you can go and ask bankers. You will not hear many people objecting. And why this hasn't been understood is, uh, is uh, beyond me, but uh, because I'm not telling you any new stories. I'm not giving you new theories. I mean, the model is a little different, but this is not a new theory. We have always known that adverse selection is really a problem for liquidity. So uh, uh, the second thing I want to emphasize here is that, uh, that you know, this, corf this course of information, getting people to have commonality of bigger and bigger things, is actually expanding liquidity, and that's wonderful. The problem is, as I said, that it just makes the discontinuity sharper when it breaks. So if you look at the euro, or if we look at the creation of the Fed in 1913, both of them expanded latent liquidity massively. That is, the collateral that went behind the things that started to trade as, as money market instruments, euro in one case, dollar in another case. Wonderful in the sense that nobody had to ask any questions about the euro. Nobody had to ask questions about the dollar. And this really is a dangerous moment because it's a massive injection latently in liquidity. And I have this fantasy which uh, some historian in the audience, if there is one, could, uh, could, di could, uh, di uh, could uh, discredit. But there is the possibility that the creation of the Fed was actually the cause of the Great Depression. Just because it expanded so much liquidity and gave rise to the boom. Euro is certainly in that category in my mind. People, you know, just really believing everything is credible, including, you know, all the, the Greek debt and everything, all these debts, and, uh, and therefore. And the problem is, in, in the case of the U.S., the Fed, they came up with a brilliant invention of deposit insurance, which worked beautifully when all the deposits were small. To our problem today is that, uh, that we have we haven't sold the deposit insurance for wholesale funding, for market-based funding. We thought that the repo markets was a good attempt by backing up these assets with pretty credible securities, low volatility collateral, but we have learned otherwise. And so my point is that, uh, that you know, this is a version of you, you create seat belts, you know, people will drive faster. That's the problem. So policy lessons are quickly, don't regulate, for God's sake, don't regulate just based on us being now in a problem. So the hockey stick, you know, if we are starting looking at it as transparent, forgetting all about the whole purpose of liquidity, which is no questions asked. That would be a gigantic mistake in my view. And you'll see just uh, uh, at the last point why, why it is a mistake. Transparency, no panacea. You know, it's not a solution. Money market funds may, I am of the view that they should be curtailed. But you know, should it be done with transparency? Should it be done with some regulation? I don't know. The basic logic that regulators uh, that I advocate is that you know, less questions asked gives more liquidity. Bigger, less questions asked, I could add, add also more collateral. Uh, bigger systemic risk, tighter regulation. This comes from the simple and naive thinking about seat belts. You know, driving faster, you got to also have something to prevent people from driving faster. So this is a big challenge how to solve this equation. I think one should be very careful with the language. Never again is a horrible word. 
I mean, couldn't be worse to say because in a state where you have a lot of liquidity as you had when the euro was created, the more you say never again, the more you are really making it, you know, liquidity increase if it affects people's minds. The last point I got, this is an important thing. So my view of the euro, where Europe, Europe has of course done a lot of problems, but an event that was extremely troubling from the perspective I have advocated is that in July when they did their second stress test, they were criticized for not stress uh, testing you know, the, uh, the sovereign debt crisis. And their response was, yes, but we gave you all the information that so that you can look what the crisis will cause. You can have your view of you know, what the likelihood of uh, Greece going under or whatever. Here is all the information on how it's going to affect the banks. In the view I'm talking about, it couldn't have been a more devastating move. I mean, transparency without action. That is, don't be just transparent. This move can only be explained by a person believing that transparency in its own right is all it takes to some extent, to simplify matters. In the view I'm advocating is never ever be just transparent if you are, you know, if you are in this kind of situation. You got to collateralize, and in fact, here is the next to last line. Getting back to ignorance, as I've expressed it, that is people can ignore information and not ask questions, it almost always happens to be ca capitalization. That's how the Scandinavians got out of the crisis. That's how many other people have gotten out of the crisis, including uh, the, the 19th century uh, clearing houses, which that was an era where you had a lot of banking crisis. The answer was always the same become opaque, rally around, you know, many banks, increase the collateral, exploit the credibility of the whole banking system as opposed to a single bank, and then clean it out the bank, you know, just within, it, within the system and not in front of everybody. The way that Europe, uh, in by opening the bags and saying, you can look yourself to see what it's worth. That was, as I said, in my view, a grand mistake. And you can look, by the way, it's not out of the question that this was it wasn't the cause of the crisis where we are right now, but just go and look at the VIX index, which is a volatility index, and see when it started and where it's now. And uh, it's consistent at least with the theory that it started in, in the middle of July with the stress test, the, the, the la latest. So uh, thank you very much, gracias. And uh, we don't have time to questions for questions, I understand, so uh, sit it there. Okay, thank you very much, Bengt. Uh, this was uh, really thought-provoking. Uh, let's now move to the next sessions. They start in 10 minutes from now, and uh, make sure that uh, you finish by uh, a quarter to six, because uh, we have to go to La Moneda. Thank you. <laughs>